So archaeology in the planning process uh, is particularly difficult to accommodate because there are a lot of unknowns. And one of the things that the planning process likes is to know what's going on and to put limits on things so that you can determine when someone's breaking the rules and someone isn't. And it's difficult with archaeology because you don't know where it is. Uh, you don't know how it survives, you don't know how deep it is, you don't actually know if there's any there in the first place half the time. And in planning terms, you don't know how important or significant it is. Um, most archaeology doesn't have any protection at all uh, legally. Uh, only scheduled monuments have any protection uh, in statutory terms. So the vast majority of archaeology in the UK is undesignated and unprotected and therefore under threat. And it's not only under threat just from development. Uh, beyond the scope of this discussion, uh, archaeology is under threat from other works outside of the planning process, including works by statutory providers, such as water, gas and electricity, which fall outside planning consent regime. Um, it's also uh, threatened by site engineering works. So, uh, for example, if you want to install one of those huge tower cranes on site prior to development, you don't actually need any permission to do that. Uh, and that involves digging a massive hole. So um, it's uh, under threat from there. Um, even archaeological work itself is ungoverned. Uh, and unlegislated. So a lot of threats to archaeology uh, and the resource itself is quite uh, in a precarious position in UK legislative terms. Um, in terms of planning, well, it, you know, it could be anywhere potentially. What should we do about it? Um, we could require blanket archaeological conditions uh, on every planning proposal. Um, we could assess every plan and application individually. Um, however, both these responses are not proportionate. Uh, and the planning process requires proportionality. Uh, so you have to be uh, reasonable um, and you have to be workable. Um, to explain proportionality, um, if we were to require the full excavation of a site uh, where someone was building a, a small extension to their property, uh, that may well cost more than the extension itself. So the planning would uh, system would deem that as not a proportionate response. So we have to behave uh, proportionately when we're making decisions about archaeology. Um, back in the early days, when archaeology was first recognised uh, within the planning system uh, as a material consideration, the then county archaeologist David Bird decided that a sensible way forward would be to zone the county into specific areas to manage the risk uh, and uh, both the risk to the archaeology and also the risk of uh, being overloaded with planning applications. Uh, so zoning allows for the highest priority areas to be targeted whilst screening out the likely less productive sites. Um, the planning system might have changed, but the system still persists. Uh, we examine the system every time they fiddle with the planning process, uh, and it um, has stayed relevant ever since. Um, the planning process is an enforcement matter, uh, either civil enforcement uh, or criminal enforcement in the case of the uh, Scheduled Monuments Act and the listed buildings legislation. So in order to be, it, remain enforceable, they need to establish parameters, uh, both in terms of how the policies work um, and boundaries on the ground. So like I said, uh, right at the beginning, uh, you're either inside or outside of the lines. Uh, and this is how enforcement can be um, sort of worked out. Uh, so the archaeological areas that we use in Surrey within the planning process, uh, there are basically four of them. Uh, scheduled monuments, uh, which are, you know, designated sites looked after by Historic England. Um, county sites of archaeological importance, areas of high archaeological potential. And then uh, within planning, sites over a certain size, in our case, 0.4 hectares. Um, for this discussion, I'm not going to look too closely at scheduled monuments because uh, they fall outside of the uh, work that we do within the team uh, and fall to Historic England. So county sites of archaeological importance, this is a basic definition. 
Uh, a county site of archaeological importance is a known archaeological heritage asset within Surrey, which is significant in either a national or regional context and should be preserved. So you'll know that's in inverted commas. Uh, that's because that's the standard definition that we use and we kind of like trial out to everyone who asks what one is. Uh, to expand on that, and I'm going to read this bit because it's quite long. CSAIs are locally designated archaeological heritage assets recognised for their significance by the county and district councils on the basis of information submitted to the historic environment record. They may de be defined in terms of their proven evidential value, their aesthetic contribution to the county, their known historic value or their importance to the communities of Surrey and or the southeast region. The boundaries should be considered to be definitive in character. Remember what I said about the planning process needing boundaries. Sites worthy of consideration can be identified through a combination of documentary assessment and or archaeological fieldwork by qualified and informed persons or organisations. The designation is based upon a recommendation from the County Council archaeological officers that the site could be considered to be of schedulable quality according to the national criteria. Some, but not all, CSAIs are wholly or partially scheduled already. Development proposals shown to be adversely affecting the heritage significance of a CSAI will be resisted and advice given by the historic environment planning team in response to planning consultations will reflect this principle. So we treat them as quite prohibitive in terms of whether or not development is allowable on them or nearby if it affects their significance. Uh, the other one that we'll talk about, which uh, I think you'll probably be more familiar with, uh, area of high archaeological potential, and again this is a standard definition that we troll out when asked what one is. Uh, an area of high archaeological potential is a defined area where it's strongly suspected that there is an increased likelihood of archaeological remains being revealed should ground disturbance take place. And again, to read the extended uh, definition, uh, it's a local designation described by the County Council and adopted by the County District and Borough Authorities for use within their local plans. Boundaries of these areas should be considered to be approximations for planning purposes rather than definitive edges. They have been selected on the basis of archaeological, historical, cartographic information contained within the historic environment record and can include categories of site from isolated areas within the landscape where finds have been reported through to known historic settlements such as town centres. Not all sites of known archaeological discoveries are designated as AHAPs, and because of their comparative rarity, prehistoric sites have been accorded greater weighting within the process. Development within an AHAP is not prohibited, but it is likely to require the implementation of the archaeological assessment and mitigation measures set out within the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, and again, note uh, what I said about boundary treatment there. Well, we consider the boundaries of AHAPs to be approximations for planning purposes, but the planning system actually requires us to draw hard lines. Um, the approximation bit is important because it allows us a bit of flexibility when we're looking at applications that straddle sites, for example, or are adjacent. Uh, so these are the uh, basic assessment criteria for how we decide what should be a CSAI or uh, an AHAP. Um, have there been archaeological interventions nearby? Uh, do we suspect there's archaeology on the site? This is like usually from the HER. Um, uh, is it a significant site? Are we just looking at, um, you know, a kind of a ditch field boundary or does it look like a settlement, for example? Um, has the archaeology been damaged or destroyed? Are, are we aware? Uh, is there um, a lot of correlating evidence that goes with it? So historic maps, for example, or does the LIDAR look any good? Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that we use to determine whether or not a site should be uh, designated in some way. Uh, just outline some of these, the sources of evidence. Um, I won't read all these out, but you can see from that um, that it's not just the HER that we use. There's site reports and stud local studies and um, the data from the PAS, uh, maps and LIDAR are particularly important, uh, but also um, work that people do locally. Uh, if they let us know that they've found something nearby or they've been doing some work particularly on a site, 
2014, um, just after the National Planning Policy Framework came in in 2012, actually, um, it takes a couple of years for these things to filter through uh, properly. Um, but we realised that the existing AHAPs and CSAIs weren't really fit for purpose. Uh, they've been in place since about 1990 uh, and were too far out of date to be reliable. Um, so every single uh, area in the county was reappraised. Uh, all the sources that I've listed previously were looked at again and reconsulted. And a call for site went, uh, sites went out. Uh, some of you might remember that from the bulletin at the time. Um, we called for uh, suggestions. Uh, we also added a lot of new categories of sites. So previous AHAPs didn't really cover things uh, like Second World War monuments or landscapes, for example, or more recent post-medieval uh, uh, sites. Uh, and there was also a disproportionate um, amount of prehistoric uh, AHAPs as well, based on single finds. And we created a standard table for consistent assessment. Uh, so this is uh, the prehistoric version, the early prehistoric version of our assessment table um, that we had. Uh, so you can see uh, there the, the evidential value. So a single fragmentary piece of evidence, i.e. Yeah, a single Paleolithic flint artifact. Uh, we judge that to be fairly low in terms of significance because there's a lot of that as exists as background noise uh, with, within the Surrey landscape. Uh, but obviously where you get more of them together, that's more significant. So you can see there how we define um, what particular kinds of finds that they may well be in the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic periods, for example, and how significant they might be. So when it comes to looking at uh, sites actually on the ground and areas uh, and the HGR, we can determine quite quickly whether or not we think something is significant or not. Uh, when we finished the review, um, the total area of the county that we designated as being of high archaeological potential uh, comes down to about 2.5% in total, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, and it isn't. Um, in but so in planning terms, it, that it would qualify as a proportionate response uh, to the issue of whether or not there's archaeology present and how we deal with it. Um, you can see it's quite a tight focus. That's what 2.5% of the county looks like uh, if you make it kind of like on the ground. Um, but obviously that's blown apart and spread across everywhere. Um, this slide gives you a quick idea of uh, how the review went. Uh, so only about 26% of the existing AHAPs and CSIs were retained unchanged during that review. Uh, we deleted 34% and we amended 40% of the existing ones that we had uh, from 1990. This is an example of the kind of change uh, that you can see. Uh, so uh, the top map is the Guildford AHAP from 1990. Um, that shows uh, obviously Guildford Castle in red. Uh, you can also see um, some of Pewley Hill, uh, 19th century Hillfort in red. So uh, they were the uh, county sites of archaeological importance within that. Um, the lower one shows what the centre of Guildford looks like after our review. Uh, and I've had to zoom out a bit here because we've made an enormous new AHAP up towards Stoke Park because of the discoveries found at Guildford Fire Station. Uh, you can also see there's a new one in between them. Um, in between Stoke Park and Guildford Town Centre uh, for the uh, Mesolithic site at Woodbridge Road. Uh, we've turned all of Pewley Hillfort into a CSAI instead of having half of it as an AHAP. Uh, and the um, Guildown Avenue Cemetery has appeared. Uh, that was not an AHAP before. So uh, given what we know about Guildown Cemetery, that will give you an idea of the kind of level of sites uh, that we were looking at that weren't currently dealt with. In uh, We added an awful lot of new sites. Um, there's some military earthworks at Chobham. I'm, I'm going to admit here, I've cribbed this site from Ale one of Alex's presentations, so I don't quite know what all of the pictures are, um, but you'll get a rough idea of, uh, of what we're looking at. 
Uh, there's the military earthworks at Chobham uh, have been added. Uh, that uninspiring looking concrete lamp is the um, Atlantic Wall on Dursley Common. Um, we've had uh, a lot of environmental work done, so that was factored in. There are new AHAPs based on peat deposits, for example, which might contain archaeological information. Uh, there's Walton Heath Roman Villa, that was not an AHAP before. Uh, there's a couple of cemeteries uh, and some uh, other work that was done. I think that's Ashton, but I'm not sure. Uh, just as a final note, uh, zoning, uh, as I've described it here, uh, only works to cover the areas that you already know have got some archaeology in. Um, if you want to be comprehensive, you need to have a policy in place that looks at areas where you don't know if there's any archaeology or not. Uh, so this leads on to the 0.4 hectare policy, which I mentioned uh, back at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, that's how we address the remaining 97.5% of Surrey. That covers developments over a certain size, uh, and we hope to capture uh, any archaeology within those areas uh, as and when large development sites outside of AHAPs come up. Uh, that also uh, satisfies the planning processes requirement for proportionality. So we're not looking at all the developments, but we do uh, require all the big ones uh, or major developments, as they're correctly termed, to be looked at. Um, it's important to remember that CSAIs and AHAPs are not truly archaeological areas. Um, so if you're doing academic research and you want to look at the rough extent of an Iron Age settlement, you shouldn't be using an AHAP to do it. Uh, there are planning areas for notification for planning purposes. Um, neither a CSAI or an AHAP designation will protect a site from anything going on outside of the planning process. So in that uh, way, they don't operate like scheduled monument uh, areas would. Um, is it a 100% effective system? Uh, well, no, uh, it can't be because we're not looking at everything. We don't look at sites under 0.4 hectares within the planning process. Um, and we also don't know where all the archaeology is, obviously, because uh, the whole county hasn't been mapped. However, it is, uh, we think, the best that we can do within the legislative rules and regulations that are, are out there for us to follow as planning officers. Um, and do we miss things? Yes, probably. Um, we have to hold our hands up there. Uh, there's development going on everywhere uh, from large housing estates to uh, extensions, road building, uh, pipelines, uh, electricity cables, you, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, does some of that affect archaeology that we probably never get to see? I suspect it would, but I can't tell you how much because we don't know. Um, but uh, like I said, within the uh, the regulation framework that we're working, uh, we think we do the best we can and we do pick up an awful lot. And we don't believe that we miss major sites. 